Um, I want to turn to John Heilman and ask him about this because <clears throat> former President Trump wants President Biden to return to the race and become the Democratic nominee. In a Truth Social post yesterday, Trump wrote in part, quote, Kamala should be investigated and forced off the campaign and Joe Biden allowed to take back his rightful place. He got 14 million primary votes. She got none. It all stems from the vice president's recent interview with 60 Minutes and Trump's false claims. The program edited the sit down to Harris's benefit. Those comments come after Trump backed out of a scheduled interview with the outlet due to 60 Minutes saying that they would indeed fact check him and that CBS News would not issue an apology to him for his 2020 interview. And this is the thing. When you're choosing news sources, there are some that will check facts and make sure the facts are good and tell you if they've made a mistake in real time so that you understand the full context. And there are some that won't. John Hammond, what do you make of Trump's comments about Biden and also this narrative that they're weaving about Kamala Harris not being chosen? Well, um, Mika, I think um, any of us who have had the experience of visiting a elderly failing relative or parent in a like in an assisted living facility um, you occasionally uh, will find uh, those th them and their and their and their fellow assisted living facility residents it lost in reverie they kind of think back mm -hmm. to the good old days they sometimes can't they kind of lose track of where they are uh, in time they, they may be 80 years old but for periods of time they imagine they're still 40 and they kind of get lost in that dream space Donnie this happens uh, with Donnie on a regular on a regular <laughs> basis, and and I think what that's what we really see with Donald Trump is we see you know he's still not gotten over the fact that the good old days for him the 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 best of times those moments uh, were with when he still had Joe Biden when he was still on the fast track to to winning this election easily. And the closer we get to Election Day and the closer we get to whatever reality is going to befall him, the more we see Chad Trump's lapse into those kind of uh, nostalgic reveries. I, I, you know, this is not the race that he spent four years wanting to run and he can't let go no. of it. Yeah. So, Rev, um, All right. Let me real quick, Mika, just also on this theme, uh, Donnie, yeah. let's get you in on this. Um, the playbook uh, just now talks about how Trump's been canceling interviews. And they've got reporting that he was in a sit-down conversation with a, a podcast called The Shade. Um, and the people at the podcast say right. that the reason why Trump's campaign said he'd have to cancel it was, indeed, exhaustion. Uh, which is the Trump campaign now disputes, but they have multiple sources saying that's why they were told they can't do it. I, I think people should really focus on his kind of state, state of strength, state of weakness, state of well-being, state of non-well-being. Something's off. Something is off. He's really, you know, he is he's addicted to crowds. He's addicted to media and he's pulling back. So they're seeing something internally and they're feeling something. And I think the spotlight should be on that. I think it's been clear for those of us that have known and dealt with Donald Trump pro and con for years, that he is really, uh, in many ways, not the Donald Trump that we fought or that we dealt with. No energy there, no sound bites that make sense. He's lost it. And I think that it's almost like pushing an old boxer back in the ring that you know he can't fight, but just tell him to hold on to the 10th round. And they're trying to make him hold on, and he just doesn't have it. He's sitting in the stool saying, I don't want to go back. Let's bring in New York Times chief White House correspondent and NBC News political analyst Peter Baker and former Biden 2020 senior advisor Alencia Johnson. Peter, both candidates there in Michigan today, home to some 200,000 Muslim voters. We know Israel's been a major issue where progressives and Arab Americans want to see VP Harris charting a different course from President Biden. So with Hamas's leader dead now, does she have a chance to do that? Yeah, it's an interesting question whether she can pivot a little bit. She probably won't do anything that seems to be a direct contradiction to President Biden's policy. She's made very clear she doesn't want to do that, not just on Gaza, but on any you know significant uh, 
uh, policy issue at the moment. She wants to be seen as loyal to her president, even as she's trying to distinguish herself. But I think it does raise the question of whether she can at least uh, make an emphasis about the need and the war, whether she can take what President Biden just said, as you showed him on the tarmac in Berlin, and expand it to that audience to say, look, it's our administration that wants to free the hostages and end the uh, the war in Gaza and, 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 and explain to those voters who may be skeptical of her that she would be better on the issue that they care about than Donald Trump. But that's been a hard sell up until now. And she's balanced, she's walking a very, very tight line here between loyalty to the president and trying to appeal to these disaffected Democrats. Alencia, even as Trump says he'll reinstate the Muslim travel ban, says he won't allow refugees from Gaza into the country, Republicans still are seeing an opening with Arab American voters, especially in Michigan, similar to how some Hispanic voters are breaking for Trump despite his harsh immigration proposals. How does VP Harris counter this with just a couple weeks left? Listen, I think she continues to do what she, this campaign and she has been doing, which is having open conversations with the community leaders and listening to them and being in Michigan and being present. I also think too, you know, yes, Donald Trump has been in office and a heavily populated area in Michigan. But my conversations with a lot of uncommitted voters, Arab American voters, Muslim voters, they don't necessarily see Donald Trump as the answer. And so it, it, to me, it seems as though it's a waste of time and energy for Republicans because Donald Trump has said that he could decimate uh, Gaza, right? He has said extremely hard things and criticism. So it is interesting that they are trying to engage a community that, quite frankly, Donald Trump has shown for his position on in the Harris campaign. In contrast, as I mentioned, will continue to talk to these voters and talk to these communities about what they need and how to be in partnership. Peter, let's talk about some new reporting in your paper when it comes to the Trump campaign. Various Trump allies and advisors think the former president's increasingly rambling appearances at the end of this campaign are becoming a liability. On one hand, this is Trump being Trump, right? Is, is it a liability? Well, look, it is Trump being Trump to some extent. People obviously go to his rallies and expect him to be, you know, entertaining in a way. And they see the sort of uh, rambling and sometimes incoherent performances as, as part of the shtick. Uh, but I think that he has, in fact... Uh, demonstrated change in the last few years. We spent a lot of time going back and looking at rallies over the last 10 years and noticed that his speeches and his rallies have grown uh, longer, uh, more incoherent at times. He uses more uh, all or nothing language. He uses more profanity. These are all signs in theory of uh, an aging candidate. And, and the uh, politics of age have been flipped, right? He had President Biden on the other side of the contest for a while, and he could focus on Biden's issues in terms of capacity and, and, and frailty. Uh, but now it's Trump who's the oldest candidate in the race and would be the oldest president in history if he wins and finishes out a second term. And so I think there are concerns about whether or not he is up for the job. And you see that uh, reflected among some Republicans who are supporting him, worried that he's uh, he's not showing the same uh, capacity that he wants did as he heads into this final stretch. It's certainly something his opponent wants to highlight, Alencia, as we've seen the vice president repeatedly calling Trump unhinged, unstable, and she just dropped a new ad focusing on that. Watch. If he wins, he'll ignore all checks that rein in a president's power. It's all in Trump's Project 2025 agenda. A second Trump term, more unhinged, unstable, and unchecked. We are down to Donald Trump has been canceling interviews left and right in the waning days of his campaign, but still found time to appear on a conservative podcast that was released earlier today where he blamed Ukraine's president for his country getting invaded by Russia. I think Zelensky is one of the greatest salesmen I've ever seen. Every time he comes in, we give him $100 billion. Who else got that kind of money in history? There's never been. Mm. And that doesn't mean I don't want to help him because I feel very badly for those people. But he should never have let that war start. That war is a loser. 
Michelle Goldberg is an opinion columnist in the New York Times. Her latest column is titled, America's on the Brink of a Great Political Realignment. It's already visible in Arizona. Faz Shakir serves as the campaign manager for the 2020 Bernie Sanders campaign. He's now the co-founder and executive director of More Perfect Union, and they join me now. First of all, I'm just going to start with like a, a, a sort of somewhat superficial, but to me, th legitimate thing. He sounds really weird, Donald Trump. He's got this Brando and Apocalypse Now thing going on with his voice. At all his things, he, the trains of thought have gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. They've gotten more digressive. And he's doing a lot of media, mostly with very friendly outlets like that podcast. But when you look at the answers, there, it, it is just nonsense. Right. It's unintelligible. It is unintelligible. If you, like, if you printed it in the newspaper just kind of verbatim, it would look like it was a random word generator. And yeah, and he's, I still think that we, the collective, we are underreacting to that bizarro kind of musical event that he did the other night. I mean, if Joe Biden had done anything remotely similar, if he'd done it for five minutes, never mind 40 minutes, swaying on a stage while playing music and saying nothing while everybody <laughs> sort of pretended it was normal and looked around awkwardly and tried to figure out how to respond, the calls for Joe Biden to get out of the race, the calls for anyone else to get out of the race. I mean, our ability to our, our kind of ability to understand or talk about what's normal is so out of whack. And obviously, you know, Trump being senescent is pretty far down the list of kind of reasons why he shouldn't be president. Right, exactly. You know, yes. nevertheless, there is something going on here. Yes, I, I, I joked the other day, it's a little like the food is terrible and the portions right. are too small. Right, I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, yes, the, the it's like do you really want him at his one who kind of can't accomplish anything. Um, Faz, it's interesting to me, so there's, there's, a, there's always a sort of choice with Trump on what you're hitting him on. And it's interesting to me, two things. One, that they have been really going on the democracy stuff. Milley, the, the threats he's been making, January 6th, hammering that. At the same time, when you're looking at their ad spend, Donald Trump keeps hiding away and keeps canceling events because of his mental decline. That's what people are saying. That he's not only canceling tough interviews, right? But that he's canceling events with friendly groups like the NRA. Now, I mean, I get that's a two awful groups, right? The Trump campaign and the NRA, both responsible for so much suffering in the United States unnecessarily, right? But that's a friendly room to Trump. Remember, even after the tragedies we saw in Texas uh, last summer, where, where, uh, in Uvalde, remember, we all remember this. A day or two after that, Trump still went to the NRA, right? He, so, even at the time of Nash, international, because people were people all over the world saw that and were, 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 were devastated, right? But in a moment of global tragedy, Trump still found the time, the energy, and the wherewithal to go speak to one of the scummiest rooms in the country. And yet during a political campaign where the tensions are much lower, there hasn't been one of those things high profile in a few weeks, which in the United States is a long time, right? Because it happens almost every day now. Donald can't go there. Ask yourself this. What would you say if Harris couldn't go speak to the auto workers? What do you say if Harris was doing so bad she couldn't go speak to a group of uh, w women college students? You'd be like, oh my God, Kamala's blowing it. She must be really sick and really scared and really spiraling and depressed. You'd be right to, to, to assume that. But that's what's happening with Donald. He can't even go talk to his best friends anymore. That's how bad it's going.